Now that we've got the math nailed down for these second order linear problems, I'm going to talk about the most important applications, which are oscillators. And the starting point is oscillations due to a spring. So imagine a spring hooked up to a wall. It's got some natural length that it sits at. And if we stretch it by an amount x past that natural length, then it will pull back. So if x is positive, you'll get a negative force for some constant k. And that's called Hooke's Law. Likewise, if x is negative, it will push. So it's always in opposition to the displacement. And that's the key to making an oscillation. So if we attach a mass to the thing and apply Newton's third law, then we just get that mx double prime is equal to negative kx. Or we could write that as mx double prime plus kx equals 0. We would call this an undamped mass spring system. It's not just masses and springs. Um, chemical bonds can also behave similarly, although maybe not linearly. To generalize this, we're going to often add some friction, or what's called a dash pot, to oppose the motion. And that introduces an additional term with x prime. So all three constants here, m, b, and k, are positive. This will be our mass spring oscillator. Another important type of oscillator is the pendulum. So you've got hanging from the ceiling, you've got some rod of length L, and it makes an angle of theta with the vertical. and there's a mass at the end of it. It turns out that the mass doesn't matter to the equation of motion. We've got theta double prime plus a friction coefficient again, gamma. Theta prime plus g over L sine theta equals zero. So that's the true pendulum equation, but it's nonlinear because of sine theta. That makes it very difficult to deal with. And so we're going to take a linear approximation of sine theta. For small angles, sine theta is roughly equal to theta. So that's our linear pendulum equation. third example we'll use of an oscillator is an RLC circuit. So here you have an inductor with inductance L. That acts a lot like inertia or mass. We've got a resistor, R, which acts like friction. And we've got a capacitor, C, which acts like the spring. It stores energy. And this is all hooked up to a generator. The generator provides an EMF, E of T. So if we let I of t be the current, then it's Li double prime plus Ri prime plus 1 over Ci equals E prime of t. So the interpretation of the constants here is different, but the math is the same. We're going to put any of these problems into a standard form. That makes it easier to analyze them. So we'll start, let's say, with the mass spring equation, but it could be any of the three examples. Now, M here has, in the, in the mass spring problem, M has units of mass. X double prime has units of length over time squared x prime is length over time, so b must be mass over time. x has units of length, so k must be 
mass over time squared. And then the driving term would be a force. And of course, force is mass times length over time squared. So there are different ways of expressing these. But what we're going to do is we're going to divide through by the mass so that the leading coefficient of x double prime is 1. And for now, we're going to assume no external force. So these are sometimes called free vibrations. So the constant b over m has units of 1 over time. k over m has units of 1 over time squared. And instead of using those two quantities, we're going to use two different ones because they make it easier to talk about the system. We'll have omega 0 squared is k over m. And 2 times capital Z times omega 0 is b over m. So that defines omega 0 and z. So now the standard form of our ODE is x double prime plus 2z omega 0 x prime plus omega 0 squared x equals 0. Omega zero or omega naught is called the natural frequency of the system, and it has units one over time, or radians per second. It's not quite the same thing as frequency used in electrical engineering. Sometimes this is called angular frequency. It's, it's different by a factor of two pi, but in math we use this as the, the natural frequency. Capital Z is known as a damping coefficient. A lot of times it's written as the letter zeta, but that can be hard to write and read. So I'm using z instead. Both of these constants are non-negative. And together they completely determine or characterize the motion of the system. We already know how to solve this system. The characteristic equation is lambda squared plus 2z omega 0 lambda plus omega 0 squared. When we use the quadratic formula, some things get simpler, which is why we chose these constants the way we did, or at least it's part of the reason. We want the after to expressions to look good, not the before expressions. The eigenvalues are minus omega zero z plus or minus omega zero times the square root of z squared minus one. And we're going to break these solutions into four major categories depending on the value of capital Z. First up, we have Z equals zero. This is known as the undamped case. It's actually where I started with the hook, with the mass in the spring. It's actually where I started with the mass in the spring. Here the eigenvalues are purely imaginary. So we get a solution that oscillates at frequency omega naught. That's why it's called the natural frequency. Without any damping, 
That's the frequency that the system oscillates at. And as usual, we have the three different ways of writing it, complex form, cosine and sine form, or phase amplitude form. This type of solution is known as simple harmonic motion. Harmonic is another name for one pure frequency. For example, let's say we had a mass of 2 in whatever units and a spring constant of 9 with no damping. The natural frequency is the square root of k over m. So here that would be the square root of 4.5. And the damping coefficient is zero when there's no damping. So the eigenvalues are pure imaginary. We get a sine cosine solution. Let's suppose we are given initial conditions. Remember for a second order problem, we have to have initial values for x and x prime. So given those, we ask, what's the amplitude of the motion? How far? Does it get away from the equilibrium at its max? So if we use the cosine and sine form of the solution, then we can apply the initial conditions. and it's very easy to solve for A1 and A2. Now remember, if we wanted to write this in phase amplitude form, then the connection between A1, A2, and R and theta is the polar coordinate conversion. That means that r is the square root of a1 squared plus a2 squared. And that's how we can find the amplitude. Next case to consider is when z is between 0 and 1. We call this an underdamped situation. So in this case, the eigenvalues are complex with a negative real part and an imaginary part equal to omega naught times square root of 1 minus z squared. This imaginary part we'll call omega sub d for the damped frequency, it's always less than the natural frequency. So in the presence of damping, the thing oscillates more slowly, which makes sense. But in addition to oscillation, we now have an exponential decay. And then we can use cosine sine or phase amplitude as we like. As I'll show, it's not really necessary to memorize these formulas to produce solutions. It's the same thing that we've been doing up to now with second order equations. When the damping coefficient equals one, we say the system is critically damped. And when that happens, we get a double eigenvalue at negative omega zero. 
that means that we have a solution which is an exponential times c1 plus c2 times t. So with this t term here, we are throwing in a little bit of linear growth. However, when you compare that to exponential decay, it's like Bambi versus Godzilla. Godzilla's going to win. Finally, the last case is when the damping coefficient z is greater than 1, and we call this overdamped. Now we get two distinct real eigenvalues. and they are both negative. As you know, this is the easiest case to solve. You just write down linear combination of two exponentials. So in an overdamped situation, there's no oscillation anymore. You can prove, in fact, that the solution goes through zero at most once. This is probably the situation you want for an airplane wing or for a building. So strongly damped that it can't oscillate. Here's a numerical example. Let's say the mass is 5 kilograms. The spring constant is 11 newtons per meter. And the damping coefficient B is 8 newton seconds per meter. Then we have 5x double prime plus 8x prime plus 11x equals 0. The natural frequency is the square root of 11 fifths, which is about 1.48, and that's in 1 over seconds units. And z, the damping coefficient, which is dimensionless, is about 0.54. So right away we know this system is underdamped somewhere medium damped between nothing and critical or overdamped. Now, as I said, we don't really have to memorize all those formulas to make the solutions. It still is all just a matter of the eigenvalues or the characteristic values. You just find the roots of the quadratic. Because these are complex, you have a real exponential part with sine and cosine. Here's a graphical demonstration of what can go on in the unforced oscillator. So here's our linear oscillator equation with the three coefficients a, b, and c. And I'm going to be able to change those over here. In response to those coefficients, we can calculate the natural frequency and the damping coefficient. And we can see the characteristic roots or the eigenvalues of the associated companion matrix in the complex plane. Then down here, we get a plot of the solution, or a solution, for particular initial conditions. All right, so initially, I've got the damping coefficient the B turned off completely, and so Z is accordingly zero. That means that the characteristic roots are purely imaginary, plus or minus I times the natural frequency, and that's the square root of C over A, so that's why it's 2 here. So this solution here would be cosine of 2T. Now as I increase C, 
that increases the natural frequency. So the eigenvalues move out along the imaginary axis away from the origin. And the solution itself gets higher and higher frequency. If I were to increase the A coefficient, that's like increasing the mass of a, on a spring, that brings the frequency back down again. Now, if I start turning on the B coefficient, then the damping coefficient becomes non-zero, and instantly you can see this exponential decay in the solution. The eigenvalues have now moved off of the imaginary axis, and they have a negative real part. And that negative real part is what determines this exponential decay rate. So as I continue to increase the B, damping coefficient also increases. And you can see by the time it's you know, almost a quarter, it's actually quite strong in, in our relative terms on this time scale. But I'll keep increasing it. As I do, you see that the eigenvalues continue to move more and more left, so the damping gets stronger and stronger. But also, they're moving closer to the real axis, which means the frequency is getting lower and lower. It's not a true frequency anymore. It's a pseudo frequency inside of an exponential envelope. Nevertheless, it's getting smaller and smaller as B goes up, or as C goes up, or sorry, as Z goes up. As I get to Z equal to one, you see that those roots are now converging on the negative real axis. And at one, they coalesce into a double root. And that's the critical damping case. So up to now, everything has been underdamped. Now we are critically damped. Uh, I'll just back off a little bit again so you can actually watch the solution itself. So now, by the time I get to critical damping, there's no sense of oscillation anymore. And I can't increase B anymore in this little gadget. So I'll decrease C, and that will have the same effect as increasing Z. So as I increase the damping Z, now I, want, I went from complex roots that met down here. Now they split again, but they're purely negative and real, which means that the solution is just exponentials. And you notice that the solution doesn't change a lot anymore. It's just very strongly damped. But all of this with z greater than 1 is overdamped.